All right. Good day. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, look, my name's Paddy O'Sullivan. Um, I've been process engineer at MTW, working both at the South Plant and the North Plant. Um, at least I was up until about a week or two ago. I'm doing a different role now, but um, yeah, I'd just like to start. It's, it's a massive honour and a privilege to be able to talk here. So I've been been really looking forward to it. So that's my opening joke. Basically, the purpose of the Prezo is, is to sort of step through a number of things that happened at the South Plant, probably over, over sort of a, a three or a four year period, um, dating back, back to my predecessor who, who did a lot of work up the front end. Um, so it's just a bit of a journey to um, sort of show sort of where we were a couple of years ago towards to, to where we are now. So I'll yeah. we'll start with this. So um, this is, uh, we got four, four primary sumps, so we're a, a two-stage washery primary um, secondary circuit. So um, this is tracer testing from 2011, um, courtesy Penny Walker. Thanks, Penny. I saw you at the back there. So. Um, first acknowledgement, there's, there's lots of people who have contributed to all this work, but um, Penny's sort of number one at the top of the list. Um, so, as you, you can see from the graphs, um, this is four sumps, um, all taken at the same density. Uh, this was, was prior to us having VSD drives installed, so um, the pressures on the sumps probably varied from about 7.5D right up to 15D. Um, and as you can see, Massive difference in EPs, massive difference in cut points, and the system curve is shit ass. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, it's poor. It's poor. So um, you can see the system curve. So th this basically prompted um, some some capital work, and, and fortunately um, we got we got capital improved approved to to install um, d VSD drives across each of our sumps. Uh, and we also got some capital approved to put brand new density gauges. Um, the density gauges are really old and the nucleonic source was, was really starting to struggle. Um, so but both those got installed. The last of the VSDs got installed towards the end of, end of 2012. Yeah. So we had new density gauges in but we were just having heaps and heaps of trouble in getting them calibrated properly. Uh, particularly the operations guys, um, they'd be out taking master gauges and, and I'd have a few instrument technicians on each crew and, and they'd be making changes all the time. Uh, we, we were dead set probably doing a, a calibration of the density gauge like uh, once a fortnight sort of thing. Um, so they were just all over the place. So. Um, us and the process team sort of commissioned a bit of a project where we said, right, let's, let's get right on top of the, the problem of this, this um, density gauge variability. Um, so our, our measurement method at the time was um, a Marcy gauge, just on a, on a hanging scale. Um, so I went out probably over sort of six to eight weeks and just spent hours under the tapping points taking Marcy gauges. Um, and that graph at the top, is the, the variability of our results. So um, right at, at its worst, this is um, variability from the, the set point that the gauge is, is telling us. It was like right up at like 0.1, um, which is terrible. That's sort of worse than those previous graphs I showed you. And, and just to sort of illustrate a point, I've, I've just taken four of those points and drawn the, the partition curve, sort of just presuming the same EP in each cyclone, um, and plotted the, the system efficiency and, and it's still rubbish. So we'd, we'd spend all this capital, um, but the, um, the sort of no point having the VSDs control under good pressure when we've got variation like this in the density gauges. Um, so there was sort of two findings from the, the work we did with with um, looking at, at density gauge um, performance. And, and the first one was, it, it turns out when they were installed, um, the water cal calibration was never done on the gauge. So um, the gauge is, is basically on the, on the return line to the sump. Um, so 
medium all comes into a mixing box and then comes down into into the sump. Um, and these gauges supposedly could get done without doing the water calibration. You just needed to put a couple of constants into the to the gauge and be all right, which would have been fine. Except we entered the wrong pipe diameter. It was out by like a um, fair bit. I don't remember how much. So. We, um, we actually did the proper water calibrations and we were found we were massively out. So that basically meant we'd calibrate at say a density of 1.3 on our primaries and then a couple of days later we'd move to 1.4 um, and, and instead of that, the slope of that line being all good at different densities it would just sort of like distort itself and it would and be massive out, massively out. So we fixed that up on all our gauges uh, which, which got us a fair bit of improvement but uh, process specialist at the time kept saying to me, well, we need 005, we need 005 if we're going to um, calibration accuracy, because what's the point of spending all these resources in density control to get 005 density control if our gauges can only sort of give us, you know, 0.02 or, or something like that. So, so yeah, all right, Adam over here, 005, 005 sort of thing, so we had to do further work, unfortunately, but that's what we're there for, so that's all right. So we, um, <laughs> as you can see, I've got a photo there of our uh, fish scales with a Marcy bucket. So we, um, we did a, a whole heap of tests on just that arrangement where we'd, we'd get a 20 litre sample and we'd try and get the, the repeatability of that of that measuring system. Uh, we sort of found, like, with all the variability of the tester um, and everything, um, we couldn't get it any better than 0.02. So we, um, we trialled some different, some different methods. Um, and, and this particular hanging scale is, is really quite bad. I'm, I'm confident you could probably get it a bit more closer if you had a better one, but... Um, <laughs> Anyway, we tried a couple of different different methods. So um, the second method was a, a method we, we borrowed from HVO, uh, which was a 15 litre bucket with, with holes drilled each side. Um, and so the idea there was you, you take out the sample variability because you, obviously instead of only having a one litre sample, you, you've got a 15 litre sample. But um, the problem I found with the 15 litre bucket was due to the, the size of the, the meniscus across the bucket, I was just never happy that, well, I could never ever get it to repeat, repeat samples. Um, so, I, yeah, I just, I just didn't really think that that could give us the, the required accuracy that, that we're after. So um, we trialled um, our, our final method, uh, which, which I call the Flasky method. Um, so it takes out, out a lot of the variability. So um, the, the first part of this method is you go down to the density gauge. Um, our density gauges are set, so they're, they're taking readings every five seconds, which goes back to a PLC, which does some averaging and stuff. Um, so I call them the density gauge supply. Each time that pulse comes out every five seconds, like the, there's variability in the source. So he said you can you can take that out by extending the, the length of time that it's measured over. So um, the first thing we do is, is change that, that measured time to one, one minute. Um, so change that to one minute and go down to the, to the tapping point. Um, open up the, the tapping point. Um, and normally over sort of six or seven minutes, I'll take, take a cut using a Marcy bucket every say 30 seconds and fill up a a 20 litre bucket to about 15 litres. So over seven minutes, I'd record each time the density gauge changes. Obviously you want, you want, um, you want operations all stable with feed on and, and density control pretty good and everything. So um, that's, that's sample collection. Get about a 15 litre um, bucket of the sample that you're after. Um, normally transport that to, to an area that's sort of um, like dry and, and you can use a set of bench scales. Um, and then I've just got a little video that, I, that I'm going to show you. Because I, I went to the effort of making it, so I just really wanted to show something. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to show you 
inside. Volume, hang on. Now, there's no volume, so I'm going to have to talk you through it. The, um, the actor was real pretentious too. He just okay. And um, ah, here we go. This is sort of what I what I wanted to show you. So my 20 litre bucket. Uh, we got maintenance to make up a little paint mixer on the end of a drill, so we agitate the sample, um, and then uh, stop. I couldn't get it to stop before. There you go. Um, and transport using a one litre Marcy bucket um, into a two litre volumetric flask. Um, keep the sample nice and agitated. Uh, so like drill in one hand, agitate it up, and then take a sample, transport it in the flask, now nah, it's stopped again. That's sort of, what else is there? I don't have any volumes there. That's why you're talking about something. That's probably really good. Uh, so then, you, so you fill the flask up to just below the neck, um, come into a, like an office area sort of best or, or somewhere away from the plant for vibration. Um, put the flask onto the bench scales, uh, weigh it, record the weight, uh, then see a bottle of water in the background, um, put your PPE back on, <laughs> fill it up to, uh, fill it up to the two litre line on the flask. Um, and then re record the weight again. So for each bucket, I'll generally repeat that three to five times. Um, and I'd expect every single reading in that bucket to be within 005 of one another. And if it's not, that generally means you've made some sort of error uh, when you've, you've done your sample collection, like perhaps you haven't agitated it enough or, or something like that. Um, I'll then so if, if I was doing an initial density gauge calibration, I'd normally take three separate samples. So um, three, three separate samples collected over five to seven minutes. Um, do five flaskies on each one. Um, and then you can say the density of each sample is the average of the five flaskies. Um, and then I might just take this off. Mark me. That actor back up. So you have three samples um, with each the medium, the average of the medium being the average of your five flaskies and you compare each one against um, your density gauge reading that you've, you've recorded earlier on. Um, so the difference between the two is your density gauge error. So um, again I'd, I'd expect over the three, er the three samples for the error to be exactly the same. So if you were 0.02 out, I would expect each three sample to show you that you were 0.02 out. Um, and then you do, when you go in, and obviously it will depend on what sort of gauge you've got um, to do your calibration, but you use your, your medium sample as, as your, like, your measured sample, and then your, 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 um, your density gauge reading as your gauge reading, and then you do a calibration. So if I was to do a check though, I'll just duck out, and over five minutes, take some 30 second cuts, fill a bucket up, and then maybe do three flaskies. And then it might take 20 minutes, half an hour, and then that's your check. So, um, and then if that's within 005, then yeah, give it a green tick and, and all good. Um, and if it's not, then you can investigate further, maybe repeat it and see what happens. So, I'll just start. Uh, uh, yeah. So this started back in July last year, um, and that's the, the density gauge error as mentioned by the, as measured by the flask samples since we um, instilled this method at the South Plant. Um, as you can see, there's a massive difference, and I'm really starting to hit that 005 accuracy. Um, since we did our initial calibrations, um, I've had to do one density gauge calibration over the period of about sort of seven or eight months, which is, which is really good, and, and that's sort of where the, the density gauge supplier says we should, we should be at with, with near gauges. So, uh, so we've had really, really good win there. So we're, 
Um, back to the journey, VSD is installed, um, density gauge is installed, woeful density gauge calibration finally fixed up, so we're, uh, we're ready to go. We pulled dust of the traces out of the cabinet, um, got all their resources on board and, and ran some tracer tests. So I'll just run through the results of the tracer tests. Woeful, really bad, terrible. This is before Christmas, so I thought I'd just probably resign or something. <laughs> and, uh, oh, oh, I pursue that music career or maybe the acting career. <laughs> but what we found um, was we had a faulty pressure gauge, um, believe it or not. The, the pressure gauge had been installed um, sort of two or three years previously. It had, it had no maintenance plan. Um, apparently there's some protection rubbers that you can put up against the face of them and they were never installed. Um, so come January during our shutdown, the PLC guys had a bit of a look. Uh, they found, uh, yeah, pressure gauge issue, replaced with a, with a new pressure gauge. Um, we redid our tracer tests. Uh, and we got, finally, finally got really fantastic, <laughs> really fantastic tracer results. So like the EP is probably, uh, maybe not that accurate because it didn't use that many tracers, but, but the, the, the main thing that I, I was really after was, was the cut point difference. Uh, and they were, they were basically spot on. Um, so we really did that. Let's see what's next. Um, so yeah, we, we redid that with our primaries um, just earlier on this month. Um, and we got some really, really good results. Um, so, a lot of things. So, further on, on to all this, so back when I had those, this is our secondary circuit, which was that two slides ago where I showed you that, that graph where it was really woeful. Um, the pressure gauge was faulty, um, but the, there was a difference in differential between each, um, each sum. So one was at 0.15 um, and the other one was at 0.2. Um, so when we got them the same, we brought the one that was 0.2 back to 0.15. So I put that into our models, which showed that we had a yield decrease. Um, so I thought, well, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, not really, but we had an ash decrease as well, so we were sending better quality thermal coal out. But um, it turns out um, our, our reliability team had been doing a lot of work with the pumps and the motors, and they'd upgraded the motors on one of our secondary circuits. So it meant we could actually, instead of running at 9.5D, um, most of the time 9.9.5D, uh, we could actually run up close to 11.5 to 12D. Um, and we found when I bumped, so those previous tracer results were at 9D. Uh, when I bumped the pressures up to 11.5D, um, it actually shifted the differential and shifted the cut point of that circuit by a bit, um, so it effectively meant, um, so this is tracer testing at uh, 1.65 density. Um, instead of cutting at um, 1.8, we'd be up at 1.85. Um, so uh, we've gone with running at higher pressures. So our, our marketing team, it, it, it means to us it's, it's a yield increase, it's also an ash increase, but our marketing team's happy for us to maximise the ash on that thermal circuit. You might look at this and go, geez, that EP looks really bodgy on the right hand side. Um, so the reason for that is we seem to be, and we've only really been running these traces over the last sort of um, fortnight or maybe three or four weeks. Um, we seem to be getting a lot of retention um, and at the same time as doing the trace tests with the um, increase in pressure, we've um, decreased the spigot size as well. So we've just got a little bit of further work. Um, the EP looks looks bad because I've got a hell of a lot of missing traces in that in that time period. So in those densities, so I'm not sure that could be seam dependent because there might not be just much up there to push the traces through or not. So we've just got a little bit of further work, but 
Um, I just basically wanted to demonstrate that we're seeing some benefit um, because of that, that shift in, in differential. So, value, valuation of benefits. So, um, primary DSM efficiency improvement. Um, our models sort of tell us um, being re really conservative using an average seam, um, semi soft yield increase around about 2 to 4%. Um, uh, primary DSM, that's actually supposed to say secondary DSM differential improvement. <laughs> I was just making sure everyone's awake in the stage of presentation, so that's good. I'll give us a pass. Um, yeah, our models sort of tell us that, that we can increase yield by sort of half percent um, with a thermal ash increase of, of around about half percent as well. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks, thanks for your time and listening. Uh, any questions for Patty? Is the total yield increase you get three plus a half, and that's around half extra, or just? Uh, no, nah, so that, that, that two to four is just product we can sell as a premium as semi soft, so. So, um, so half a percent overall increase? Um, yeah, that, that's right. So half a percent overall, and yeah, two to four percent that we can sell as a premium. And like, yeah, when, when you do the numbers for us, it's, it's they're good looking numbers, so pretty happy for it. Happy with it. Uh, yep. Yeah, Bob Jackson. The price adjustments you were doing, were they Chris Wood's radio frequency? Pinos or um, the old manual ones? Nah, they were just, just the manual cubes. So we're, we're fortunate at the South Plant, we've got good access to the front of our screen. So, um, yeah, they're, they're the cube tests. How much did Chris pay for that, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you later. No so, my, my uh, recommendation if, if, if you're going to get Chris Wood's radio test, make sure your gauges are calibrated properly because how embarrassing would that be to pay all that money and then have people come back and say, Got poorly calibrated density gauges. Something that you can check with our traces, so that would be my tip. All right. All right. Paddy, thank you very much. I think very interesting um, presentation. Thank you very much for Paddy for coming out. I think it's important to understand what a lot of the plants are doing out there at the present moment. It's always good to have a speaker from the plants themselves. Um, in the time of where increased productivity is so important, every plant chasing every ton and every um, percent efficiency, I think, thank you, thanks for uh, letting us understand what you guys have done there. All right, on behalf of the New South Wales ACPS Committee, thanks very much, Patty. Okay.